Now let's take a look at single replacement reactions. Um, over thousands and thousands of experiments and hundreds of years doing lots of experiments with various elements and compounds, we've learned that simply put, there are some elements that are more reactive than others. And so we have generated a list of elements called the activity series that is specifically arranged to tell us which elements are the most active or reactive and which elements are the least reactive. The elements at the top of an activity series are the most reactive, the ones at the bottom are the least reactive. So this helps us understand how to predict and write equations for single replacement reactions because simply put, more reactive elements replace less active elements. It also helps us understand that there are various combinations of elements and compounds that simply don't react because they're not reactive at all. So there are two sets of activity series. One is for metals, the other one is for halogens. And we're gonna tackle the halogen one first because it's much easier and is pretty intuitive to understand. The activity series for halogens is the group 17 group from top to bottom. The most active is at the top. The least reactive is at the bottom. So fluorine will always replace chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine in chemical reactions. Chlorine will replace bromine, iodine, and acetine, but it will not replace fluorine. Fluorine replaces chlorine, but chlorine does not replace fluorine. Um, fluorine has the highest electronegativity in that group, and its effective nuclear charge is incredibly high due to the fact that it has a really small atomic size, so it attracts electrons really easily and therefore reacts really easily. Astatine is at the very bottom of that group and has the lowest electronegativity, the largest radius, the greatest number of shields, and the lowest effective nuclear charge, which just means that nucleus in astatine struggles to react with things. So a single replacement reaction involving two halogens will occur if the less active halogen can be replaced by a more active halogen. Um, so if I had, for example, um, let's see, fluorine reacting with sodium chloride in solution, we can say that that reaction will happen because fluorine is more active than chlorine and we will, um, we, we would be able to predict products coming out of it since that reaction does occur. However, if you had the opposite, so that, that would be chlorine gas reacting with sodium fluoride solution, that equation would not happen because chlorine is lower than fluorine and would not be able to, to replace fluorine. So here is the activity series for metals. It's over here on the left in this column. In this activity series, the metals closest to the top, so basically in this area here, are more active than the metals closer to the bottom. Really, it's that the metals closest to the top tend to be very easily oxidized. Recall that metals tend to lose valence electrons anyway in order to gain chemical stability. So those metals at the top are incredibly good at losing valence electrons. Uh, in particular, these metals here are group one metals, which are the most reactive metals of all on the periodic table. Whereas if you proceed down the activity series list, you'll see that these elements here are predominantly D block transition metals. And the lowest on this list happen to be metals like platinum, gold, and silver, your precious metals. Um, and that actually makes sense. Throughout human history, we have made huge, massive use of transition metals such as silver, platinum, and gold, not only because they're pretty, but also because they resist oxidation. So they tend to stay nice for a long time, which makes sense. We use those metals in jewelry. So this goes in general order of chemical reactivity where you have your most active, easily oxidized metals at the top and your least oxidized most resistant to oxidation, D-block transition metals close to the bottom of that activity series. So we expect that group 1A and group 2A metals being the most active will tend to have low electronegativity 
and have low first ionization energy because they give up those valence electrons incredibly easily. So what this means for you is that if you have an active metal, for example, potassium, which is close to the top of the activity series, and you have it trying to work on a compound that contains a metal that is less active than it, then the active metal, the potassium in this case, will replace the less active metal. So I would predict that in this single replacement reaction involving metals that this reaction would actually work. In other words, if you put potassium in a solution of zinc nitrate, you will expect some kind of reaction to occur. Uh, so what will happen is the zinc will be kicked out. You'll actually form zinc metal in place of potassium. And the potassium metal would become potassium ion and bond with nitrate to form KNO3 aqueous. And then we would proceed to balance that equation. So that happens in cases where a very active metal replaces a less active metal. However, this is not the case in the other direction. So if I had a similar setup where I had zinc metal popped into a potassium nitrate solution, and the question is, does something happen? The answer would be no, because zinc is less active than potassium. So in other words, the potassium stays with the nitrate and no reaction actually occurs. So this activity series for metals is a very handy guide to helping to predict whether a single replacement reaction actually happens or not. So what I'd like to do for you now is to model predicting and writing balanced chemical equations for single replacement. We'll start with the case of halogen since it is the easier of the two cases, in my opinion. Uh, along the way, I'm gonna show you two specific kinds of equations that you can possibly write. Um, the first is called the molecular equation. The second is called the net ionic equation. And along the way, we're gonna practice our unit four skills of writing correct chemical formulas for reactants and products. So you'll be given a prompt like this where the reactants are being described and a couple of hints as to their states. So we see chlorine gas bubbles through a solution of sodium iodide. Chlorine gas is Cl2. Note that it's a diatomic seven twins element uh, and it's got a state signifier of G. It is added to a solution of sodium iodide. Solution in these kinds of problems typically means that solute is dissolved in water. So that would be its state signifier. And we need to figure out the formula for sodium iodide. Um, sodium in compounds has a charge of plus one. Iodide has a charge of negative one. I need to have one of each type of ion to form a neutral formula unit. So the chemical formula for sodium iodide will be NaIAQ. And that's really all the information that I'm given here. So we need to predict the possible products. I have a halogen chlorine and it's going to react so that it replaces the iodine in sodium iodide. Um, note that chlorine is higher than iodine in group 17. So that means chlorine is more active than iodine, which is less. So this means this reaction will actually occur. In other words, we will have products being formed. So I'm going to take the chlorine, make it form chloride, and get the iodine to form as an element in the place of chlorine gas. When iodine becomes an element, it becomes diatomic, it becomes I2, and the state of I2 is a solid when it is at room temperature, which you can assume um, is the case with all of your equations that you need to work on. So um, we'll form NaCl. Chlorine in compounds usually has a charge of negative one. And you can assume that because we're in an aqueous solution that that NaCl will also be aqueous. It will also be mixed with water. Last thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna balance this chemical equation. Um, I need to have two chlorines on each side of the arrow. So I'm gonna put a two coefficient for NaCl and I'm gonna put a two coefficient for NaI so that I have two sodiums represented on each side of the arrow. What I have here is an example of a molecular equation or ME for short. We call this molecular because 
it contains the chemical formulas of every reactant and every product, but it doesn't take into account the AQ. Um, the AQ means the presence of water is important. That water is going to separate and dissociate, meaning it will break up any ionic compounds that are dissolved in the water. So um, a molecular equation doesn't show that kind of action. Uh, so while this molecular equation is very useful, there are some ions here which actually don't participate in the main changes. The main changes that are happening here would be the oxidation and the reduction of the reactants. So we're going to move on from this molecular equation and learn how to write this second kind of equation, the net ionic equation, which removes some of these unactive ions and, and reactants and products and only features the real chemical changes that are occurring. And so here's how you do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and change inks here to red and I'm going to dissociate or separate any species which is aqueous, meaning we're going to take care of the NAI and the NACL and write those two chemical species in a different way. So here's how we do that. I'm gonna leave a space for the chlorine gas. Um, let's work with this two NAI. So this means I have NAI and I have another NAI and they fully separate, they dissociate and break up because some of them are attracted to the water through the hydrogen partial positive poles of water. And some of those ions are attracted to the partial negative poles of water. So I'm going to treat this two coefficient like it's a factor as in math. Um, so when I dissociate this two NaI, I'm gonna have two Na's that come out as positive charges. And I'll also have two I negatives that come out as negative charges. So when two NaI dissociates, I get two sodium ions and two iodide ions. Now I'm going to just add the Cl2 gas. Just copy that down from the previous line. Uh, anything that's not aqueous, such as that gas, will not dissociate. So just copy it from the previous step. The I2 solid is also not aqueous. I'm just gonna copy that from the previous step. And now I'm going to dissociate that to NaCl. Again, it's just like, um, here's that Na, here's that Cl, here's that Na, here's another Cl, that's two NaCl. So I'm gonna separate that into two Na ions that are aqueous and two chloride ions that are also aqueous. So when you separate or dissociate aqueous species in this way, it becomes clear that um, there are ions, or well, just one ion that seems to have repeated on each side of the arrow. If you have species that repeat like this on each side of the arrow, it means that there has been no chemical change involving that ion. In other words, it's quote unquote irrelevant. Uh, we liken this to a athletics game where you have some ions or some people in the stands that are just watching the game but not participating. So similarly, we have an ion here that is not part of the chemical change happening, and that's the sodium. So I'm going to put a blue line through that sodium just to show that the sodium is, quote unquote, watching the game. We actually call this kind of ion a spectator ion. So the spectator ion in this example is just Na+. Uh, so now I take a look at my um, second step here and I'm going to rewrite all of the species that have survived. <laughs> These species um, are part of my net ionic equation. These actually show the real chemical action happening here. So here's my chlorine gas, here's my iodide ion, here's my I2 solid, and here's my chloride ion. This stripped down version of the molecular equation is called the net ionic equation. So here's why um, these four species survive, uh, whereas the sodium did not. Um, let's review our redox knowledge from last class. The oxidation number of chlorine is zero as an element, but the oxidation number of iodide ion is negative one. 
um, ox the oxidation number of I2 is zero and the chloride ion has a negative one charge. So what's happened is the chlorine has become negative one. So it's gained charges and become reduced. The I negative was negative one, but then it became zero. So it uh, lost an electron and it became oxidized. Its charge increased. Those are the four species that are undergoing real significant chemical change. In this case, uh, reduction and oxidation, whereas sodium um, had an oxidation number of plus one at the beginning and it still had an oxidation number of plus one at the end. So no chemical change has occurred to sodium. Therefore, we single sodium out as being the spectator ion. And so the remaining ions in the net ionic equation are the only ions that actually participate in real chemical change. So that's how you write a molecular equation and a net ionic equation for a single replacement situation involving halogens. So to help you understand what's happening in the beaker after the reaction is over, um, you might be asked to interpret or to draw a particle diagram that depicts the changes uh, that have occurred. So here's what's um, in the beaker after the reaction is over. So um, I've written the molecular equation from the last example at the top here. So really what we have represented in the below dot particle diagram is the products. So um, note that I've got NaCl present in the liquid. Um, I've got the sodium separated from the chloride. Um, note that I've got two sodiums and two chlorides. That's because I'm representing the ratios. So I've got two NAs and two CLs. They are separated from each other and solvated by water molecules. So note that I have water molecules surrounding each of these ions and note the orientation of these water molecules. So around this Na+, for example, I have the oxygen poles of the water molecules directly facing the full positive charge of the sodium ion. And for this other chloride ion on the other side, I've got the positive poles of the hydrogen um, atoms of the water molecules directly facing the chloride. Uh, I also have some I2, and it is a solid, so it's sitting at the bottom of the container. Really, since I'm trying to follow my um, stoichiometry, I should have just one giant circle um, that represents one mole of I2 being at the bottom of the container, as opposed to the two moles of NaCl floating in the liquid just above that solid iodine. Uh, so I hope that helps you understand what's happening um, or what's happened in the beaker after the reaction is over. You can assume for particle diagrams like this that there is no reactant left over. So we do not have a limiting reactant situation.